think we'll get underway. We might have a few folks uh, join us uh, a bit late, but given that we like to keep these to a half an hour, I think we should get underway. So this is Cynthia Edwards, and welcome to the first Gulf Coast Prairie LCC webinar of 2015, and Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, today we have Diana Del Angel and Jim Jabot from the Heart Research Institute uh, presenting on the report they recently completed for us on barrier island vulnerability. This project uh, just wrapped up late last year and it was initiated as part of the Gulf, Gulf Coast vulnerability assessment uh, work that we've been doing um, with the four LCCs across the Gulf. So Diana is going to be presenting today. She's a coastal geoscientist at uh, the Heart Research Institute in Corpus Christi and her research interests involve the application of geospatial tools for the study of coastal environments and coastal change and processes. He received her master's in environmental science from Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi and has dedicated her research to beach and dune morphodynamics of uh, South Texas barrier islands. So uh, we'll have Diana give us her presentation, and then we should have some time for questions. Uh, Diana, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cynthia, and thanks, everybody, for being on the call. And, yeah, so today we're going to review some of, the, some of the products that we delivered for the Bear Island Vulnerability Data Integration and Assessment Project. As this and the... This was part of the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment Project. The overall goal of that project is uh, to develop tools and assessments to enhance conservation and restoration planning and implementation and providing a better understanding of the effects that climate change, sea level rise, and land use changes will have on the Gulf of Mexico coast. Part of our project was to integrate data sets and the corresponding metadata required to make these assessments. So our tasks were basically to assess current data, existing data, review the products, consult with the technical review team on the project to get their input, and moving forward, we integrated the data as well as the metadata associated with it, and extracted any vulnerability values that had been recommended. And all this was packaged, and we have a report of all the information. So why do a vulnerability assessment in the first place? I'm not sure how many people are on the call or have been involved in the past with a vulnerability assessment, but it would these help us reveal what are some of the system species that, that may be vulnerable to expected climatic changes and might also help us understand why these resources are likely to be vulnerable. A highly accepted framework for assessing vulnerability is, is pictured here. And basically a vulnerability assessment is finding that balance between what are the impacts and what are the adaptive capacity of a species or a system. So the impacts are basic, is basically what is the exposure, what is the change in the environment, perhaps temperature, rain, more exposure to storms, wave activity, et cetera. And how is that environment or species sensitive to that change, so perhaps a freshwater species that can only live within a particular range of salinity might be more susceptible to uh, less freshwater input, something like that. And on the other hand, adaptive capacity helps us mitigate these impacts through accommodation, maybe, or migration of species or environment in as a, as a uh, response to these changes. So in applying this framework, we can answer several questions. Well, a lot of different questions. So it depends on what we are interested in. Are we interested to know 
how particular species would be affected or perhaps particular habitats, is it estuarine wetlands or sea grasses, or maybe it's a certain ecosystem process like sedimentation or carbon sequestration. Regardless of, of the questions, we can use different approaches. Approaches, For example, the index method or, or model. Models, for example, the, the SLAM model, the sea level affecting, um, the sea level affecting, marshes. affecting marshes, is an example of a mechanistic model where we have certain processes that we know are occurring and we have data to input into these models and and get our results. Another a form of assessment is using indices. So it's basically a scoring system that will get get us a relative scale ranging from low to high or very high on a vulnerability. Regardless, we need different kinds of data, current information, past information, what are the projected changes, and experts can then use this information to build the models or assign assessment values. So from here on, I'm going to focus mostly on the index method. And there's different ways to approach this. So here shown is a conceptual model, how an index would work. And basically, we have different variables assigned to the three components of the framework, the sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and exposure. And we can assign scores to all these variables based on expert opinion or expert knowledge. And we can then tally up our values to come up with a vulnerability score shown there on the right, so somewhere between low and very high based on the data that we have. So one example here is work done by Klossmeyer and others in California where they use this data-driven index approach to estimate areas that would be highly vulnerable to climate change based on different variables related to climate, land, landscape, landscape features, and adaptive capacity or adaptive constraints of the landscape. And with that, they have developed this heat map of areas that are less or more vulnerable to, to climate change. And then from here, you can develop recommendations on management efforts. Another method of applying an index is using the expert's panel scoring. And this might look familiar if you've been involved in the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Index Assessment. And it's basically a snapshot of, of the, the matrix, the, the scoring matrix. And basically, uh, expert knowledge, experts use their knowledge on the landscape, on species, to assess and score different parameters associated with vulnerability and then in the end reach a vulnerability score. Regardless of the method, we need data to support these, be it data-driven or expert panel scoring. We need the spatial representation, the information to help us make these decisions. So using, keeping these ideas in mind, our data gathering approach, and we were trying to find out, okay, what data do we need to, to provide to best help in, in achieving this vulnerability assessment. So we took all the information we could find in the literature and reports available from the LCC, as well as input from the project review team, and we developed what I call a wish list, basically, of the data needs or the different types of data that we would need to develop an index. 
And this data would satisfy the three different components of the vulnerability index, which are exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and also other background information that could supplement it. And also, we wanted this data to be to be used in, in different ways. So if you wanted to assess the morphological or the habitat or the ecosystem of a barrier island, what kind of information would we need? We developed this list and then from here, we took on the task of finding as much data as we could to satisfy these, these variables. In the end, we delivered approximately 540 data layers, and these were grouped into these themes that you see on the screen, from climate, sediment, erosion, shoreline, habitat and species, coastal processes, land use, land cover, and anthropogenic effects, bathymetry, and elevation. So this was a huge undertaking. It took a lot of merging of files, building them in a common projection, symbolizing, and making sure that the metadata was complete and in a common format for all the files. So I'd like to review some of the some of the data products that we submitted. And one of them is the climate data. The climate data it's probably our largest data set. About 300 of the data sets that we submitted are climate related. And these include historical data. For example, shown on the screen is the historical precipitation. This is an average for the month of July for the Gulf of Mexico. And this is in millimeters. And we also have projected data, also monthly for precipitation and also temperature. And shown on the screen is the average uh, precipitation, the projected precipitation. Um, this is using a medium, medium emission scenario. And also note the resolution is a little different. The projected data has a 12 kilometer resolution while the historical had a four. So these again are available for the year and for every month. And there is also these change maps. So basically what is the projected minus the observed change in, uh, in precipitation. And this is again for the month of July for the medium emission scenario in 12 kilometer resolution, but these are also available for a low emission scenario and high emission scenario. So in addition to precipitation and temperature, we've gathered other climate parameters, including moisture parameters, moisture deficit surplus, potential evapotranspiration, rainfall anomaly, and the standard precipitation index. And a lot of these are available for, for um, seasonal and seasonal layers as well as yearly averages. Now our sediment erosion and shoreline data package includes things like historical shorelines, shoreline change, uh, sediment delivery, and, and things like beach nourishment and placement areas. So shown on the screen here is a map with the relative sediment delivery. And this is a product of the World Resource Institute, as well as the USGS Coastal Vulnerability Index. So the nice thing of this index is Someone already took the time to evaluate certain parameters and assign a, a score, a risk score, on the physical vulnerability of the shoreline to sea level rise. And 
So from this map, we can see areas in Texas and in Louisiana have a very high risk of two sea level rise, although some of those areas relative um, in the Gulf of Mexico do have high sediment delivery, which plays a role in wetland accretion, but also in water quality. So those two always don't correlate all the time. Another product within this map package is the National Assessment of Hurricane-Induced Coastal Erosion Hazard, and this is by the USGS. And it basically provides information on storm impacts um, to different levels of storm surge. But also, it provides information on dune toe and dune crest elevation along the Gulf. So I really like those because you don't have to use LIDAR data and try to extract dune features and their height because these have already been done. So if you just want to take a look, along the Gulf and see where are those areas that have very low dunes and maybe have high probability of overwash and inundation, you can easily um, make a map from this data. Another information available within this these data sets include the information from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, coastal structure, sediment placement area, and as I have already mentioned, the historical shorelines and shoreline change. So moving forward to habitat and species information. So for this map package, we gathered information regarding wetlands, rookeries, oysters, seagrass, as well as critical habitat for uh, species on the Gulf of Mexico, as well as range species range maps for uh, select species as well. On the map here is critical habitat for about eight species for the Gulf of Mexico, as well as a data set from the work of Oslin and others, which show areas of current mangrove distribution and how mangrove distribution might change in the future under a low emission scenario. What is the probability of the mangrove would expand into other areas? So this was um, a nice inclusion for, for the habitat map. And they also, feature other emission scenarios, not just below. And here is a list of the different species which we have gathered either critical habitat information or which we have the range map for. And these list was provided by the project team of the LCC and we try to gather as much as data as we could. Um, we didn't collect information for all the species, but, but we still got quite a bit. So the coastal processes map provides key exposure metrics, which can be used for an assessment, and include things like sea level rise, wind, wave, and tide information. So on the map here, there's a few things going on. So we have average wind speed, and I believe these are for spring, but we have them for every, every season, as well as wind direction. And we have the mean sea level trends from NOAA, as well as a wave height layer. So the wave height is an addition that comes with the um, with the with the coastal vulnerability index, and they have gathered wave have information as well as tide range information to develop their index, and and that information can be used for other purposes as well.
So another product for the coastal processes is the, um, the, the sea level rise models, inundation models from the NOAA Coastal Services Center. And these provide water depth information for various sea level rise scenarios ranging from one to six feet. So they have inundation maps, maps of low-lying areas, and mapping confidence. So these are also uh, large data files, cause, and they are available for most states except Louisiana. So hopefully that is something that they are working on, and hopefully a product for Louisiana will be available soon. So the next group of data is land use, land cover, and anthropogenic effects. So this group will be helpful, I think, in providing information regarding the adaptive capacity of the environment because it will show us areas which are protected or managed and also shows areas that have high, imp um, high anthropogenic impact, for example, areas of roads, where ports are and where we find recreational facilities, and as well as um, the map also include an urbanization model, the SLUIS model, which has projections of how urbanization might spread in the decades to come. So one of our land cover products is from NOAA, the CCAP information, which is um, land cover information derived from the Landsat satellite. And this is available for the year, where the latest one available is for the year 2010, but also they provide land cover change maps, which compare the year 1996 to the year 2010. And so you can have information on how the land cover has changed, have the wetlands been maybe converted to open water, have they been converted to development. So this is a, a good data set to look at things like that. And then we have several layers regarding managed areas, so we have a layer for the Gulf Ecological Management Site, for uh, inventory of protected areas, as well as federal land. And in contrast to that, we have a layer obtained from the USGS of human impact avoidance. So this was a metric that was used for, for development of the species range maps, and it basically shows areas that are highly disturbed, either because there's roads, impervious surfaces, or cities. And lastly, we have our bathymetry and topography. The bathymetry is available for 20 different base systems on the Gulf, and it was obtained from the Gulf of Mexico Data Atlas. Although some of these maps are getting pretty old, but they're, they're comprehensive and they are for the whole goal, so. And our topography data is available for the barrier islands. It was built from a combination of 18 individual data sets, and these are at a two meter resolution. The the topography data was clipped to mean sea level using uh, using a mean sea level mass and has been merged into a mosaic grid for the entire Gulf. So overall, we do have, like I said, 540 different data sets for this project. These are the summary of these data sets is available in a report as well as how they can potentially be used for a vulnerability assessment. This data 
should become available or perhaps is already available through the LCC planning atlas. And just also keep in mind that new data and new products are always emerging and need to keep an eye out. And that is all I have today. Great. Thanks, Diana. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, you can just unmute your phone if that works or use the chat tool on the webinar if that works better for you. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions today, though. And, and like Diana said, the, um, all the data layers that were produced in this project will be available on the Conservation Planning Atlas. Some of them are already up there, um, but as you can see, there's a lot of information. And uh, the final report, if you're interested in that, is on our GCP website. So any questions from anyone? No? A lot of info to go through. So thanks again, Diana. Um, Bill, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we signed off this afternoon? No, I just uh, appreciate the uh, the uh, presentation and and the folks that were able to listen in. And I think one of the one of the take homes I I caught was uh, where do we where do we go to and how often do we evaluate updates and and improvement of that data set so it doesn't become a static file and and uh, and that's something that uh, our science team should uh, consider in the uh, the next steps with the uh, not only this project but others. Right, and um, I believe our next webinar is February fourth, and it will be Jonathan Clow from Warren Pinnacle Consultants talking about the SLAM evaluation project that Diana mentioned. Uh, that project was also initiated through the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment. So more information on that will be available on our website soon. So thanks again, Diana and Jim, uh, for this work, and I invite folks to take a look at the final report that's on the website, and if you have any questions specifically, please feel free to, to contact me or, or Diana. I'm sure you'd be open to that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.